I am the Great Saiyan Man, and I'm gonna beat some fashion sense into you! Oh man, hope my disguise is working. This is Gohan from Dragon Ball Z. You're listening to This Week in Geek with Mike the Birdman Dodd and the rest of the Twig crew right here on ThisWeekinGeek.net. Did you grow up with the NES, PlayStation, Star Wars, cartoons, and ABC TV? Do you like to think who would win in a fight between Batman and the Master Chief? Comics, games, movies, music, and TV. They're gonna tell you everything you need. Superheroes or nothing got your back. They're gonna save the world of geeks. Comics, games, movies, music, and TV. They're gonna tell you everything you need. Superheroes or nothing got your back. They're gonna save the world of geeks. Hello, hello. It is time for another Roundup episode. Now, what have we been doing? Well, we've been home <laughs> doing basically nothing but reviews because we can't go out other than to go like basically grocery shopping. So, there's going to be a whole bunch in here. I am not sure exactly what because I am rec- pre-recording this with the actual reviews being recorded at sporadically throughout the week. So, the uh, only thing I do know is there's going to be talk at the end about... Uh, a quick review of a horror movie that we have, as well as a contest that will be coming up that we'll talk about probably a few days after the this episode drops. Uh, but it's going to be an interesting uh, little bit here because we've got a mixture of uh, movies, uh, audio hardware, and perhaps some games coming out that we'll be talking about in here. Uh, and it's moving forward, I think we're probably going to have more regular shows because... There's going to be more stuff coming out, but also it's all going to depend on how much we can actually get sent because everything seems to be being pushed back, as you probably heard on uh, this week's episode of This Week in Geek. So without further ado, let's just get into it. We'll have all the reviews come out. I'll come back at the end and sort of uh, explain what's going on. This is a fair request, and I promise I will not judge any person only as a teenager and that this is no more right than saying all teenagers are drunken dope addicts or glue sniffers. Ever since last summer when we started reviewing more and more uh, headphones and earbuds, I had wanted to get a chance to check out uh, the Audio-Technica line of true wireless earbuds, and I have a chance now to look at uh, the wireless headphones, the, the model number is ATH-CK-S5TW, uh, uh, which is, uh, <laughs> they have an interesting way of, of numbering and labeling their stuff. But uh, needless to say, this is a pretty cool uh, set of earbuds. Uh, they come with a little charger that you, uh, you get with most of these sets now, you know, like a little charging dock that can charge so many times. But what's interesting about these guys is, unlike a lot of them that get like six or eight hours, you get 15 hours of playback time. And I was getting about 14, even at like pretty high volume on, uh, you know, on single charge and 45 hours uh, when you, you know, you can get basically three charges out of your, or two or three charges out of your base before they run out. Uh, They're 10 millimeter drivers with uh, a little bit larger base driver in the back, which is good because they provide a little more uh, oomph and sort of a fullness to them. Uh, There's a microphone for answering calls, which is pretty standard. Nothing to write home about there. Pretty standard mic. Nothing special, to be honest. Um, These ones pair using the right ear, whereas other headphones I've had, you can pair using either ear and they connect to each other. This pairs with the right ear, so that's the ear that has to be used. Uh, I was looking through documentation. I didn't see anything that said any other way. It just seems to be that's what it was. Um, Now, as far as what else is included, the big deal here is it uses USB-C to charge the uh, the charging base, which is good because anybody like myself, if you've got a modern phone or even like a game console, you can use the same uh, controller charging cable you get with your Nintendo Switch or if you have a Google Stadia or if you have uh, uh, like a phone charger like I use for uh, for my Pixel. You can just use that. So it's nice that they've gone to a better connector. Uh, they do come with multiple large, medium, small, uh, replaceable ear tips for whatever fits your ear more comfortably, as well as a silicon ring to 
fill out. There's lots of different options as far as uh, filling your ear canal, uh, which is pretty sweet. Now, these guys do support, uh, you know, different types of um, uh, of like the codex for as far as audio quality. Uh, it supports aptX, which is good. It doesn't support aptX HD, which is uh, I was hoping it would, uh, but then again, not too many devices you have to get a pretty high-end device or like a pretty high-end uh, bluetooth dongle to support that which is like basically giving you almost the same fidelity as, as a wired connection uh but aptex sounds really good because this has that extra deeper bass than a lot of the other wireless headphones these these are going to blow away most things you know they'll give like you know apple ear pods and other things that run for the money probably even delivering better bass because they are a little larger but they're not so heavy or anything they seem to fit in the ear just fine um but they support uh aac which is pretty standard spc which is standard but it does have the aptx support which is built into my phone and it was pretty noticeable as far as the the quality goes uh pretty good range the bluetooth 5.0 uh i was able to leave my phone you know at the living room and walk to the bedroom farther away and it didn't drop it it cut out a little bit when i was near some of the other electronics but that would have been audio and or electronic interference but you know if you're having this stuff in your pocket or a backpack or whatever you're gonna be fine uh i've i use them like i said about 14 hours you get up on them at like 80 percent volume that's my experience you know it might vary from person to person but overall, pretty solid stuff and pretty competitive in the price range considering the quality. So I'm pretty happy with them. Um, it'll be interesting to see if I can eventually check out some of the other ones in the line and see how they compare to each other. But I, I'm really impressed with how these wireless earbuds have progressed in the last year to two years in quality. Hey guys, Mike the Birdman Dodd here, and I have yet another special review for you, and I'm talking about VVS Films Color Out of Space. A review code was provided to us on iTunes. So this is a movie I have heard about for quite some time. Uh, this got a lot of buzz at TIFF last year in Toronto uh, at its Midnight Madness, and it stars one of my favorite actors of all time, Nick Cage. And I remember him from his glory days of National Treasure, Con Air, Face Off, uh, 8mm, all that stuff. I love Nick Cage, one of my favorite guys. So when I heard he was going to be in an HP Lovecraft adaptation, I didn't quite know what to think. And especially Color Out of Space, which is a weird HP Lovecraft story to begin with. So it's been about 20 years since I've read the original Color Out of Space short story, and it boils down to um, a meteorite or something lands in a farmer's uh, field or something and it starts infecting local wildlife and local plant life with sort of a weird glow you can kind of see at night yet kind of not and a color out of space as described by the call of cthulhu role-playing game is a gaseous life form that changes um things that it's around and sort of sort of mutates it um over time if i remember right i'd have to get my monster manual out but i don't have it in front of me but basically it warps things it changes things so the movie kind of changes that formula up a little bit it stars nathan gardner and his family uh nathan gardner's nick cage so his one Life, um, has some sort of a condition where she's really sick. Uh, there's their their daughter who's a Wiccan and their two sons. Their one son's a stoner. Their one son is just, I guess, just a weird little kid. Um, and one day something comes crashing out of the sky and they're like, what the hell was that? And uh, they meet up with this hydrologist named Ward and I'm pretty sure that's an Easter egg, the Charles Dexter Ward, who I think was um, a reference to at the Mountains of Madness, if not another H.P. Lovecraft thing. He, he's also wearing a Miskatonic University shirt, and they mention Arkham a number of times, which is big in H.P. Lovecraft, so it's in the same shared universe. Anyway, moving on. Um, and it sort of chronicles as things go wrong on the farm over time. Eventually, strange new plant life is popping up. They start seeing mutated insects. Time starts to be affected, their perceptions of things, um, how they interact with each other. And while the movie starts out really slow, the last uh, third act of this is really intense, and it gets really, really good. Um, a surprisingly good performance from Tommy Chong. That's right, from Cheech and Chong. Uh, especially right at the end. Um, 
there's something very haunting about his voice and what they gave him to say that I really, really enjoyed here. This movie is probably one of the better H.P. Lovecraft movies out there. Probably the best out there right now um, in terms of um, taking itself seriously without, you know, Cthulhu being the big bad guy. Because the Cthulhu mythos is not just the outer gods or the elder gods. It's about the weird creatures that inhabit um, all sorts of spaces in the solar system or other dimensions. So I'm glad the Color Out of Space did get um, adapted. I know the director, Richard Stanley, is doing a trilogy of Lovecraft movies, and he wants to take on the Dunwich Horror next, which I think is fantastic. I would love to see someone... um, do maybe Rats in the Walls, but I know they kind of did that on Masters of uh, Horror, that television series, if you happen to remember that. Um, So this is a really good Lovecraft movie, and I definitely think this is, if you're a Lovecraft fan, this is pretty much a must-own for your collection. If you're curious and want to see a pretty good Nick Cage movie, then getting this on VOD is absolutely worth it. You can find this from VVS Films. Last summer, I reviewed uh, Control uh, on the Xbox One X, and I had some issues with uh, end game balance stuff. Uh, it took me a very long time to be able to beat it because there were some glitches that just weren't getting fixed fast enough. But overall, I thought it was a really solid, awesome game, probably one of the best of last year. Well, now the first expansion, the Foundation, is out, and I had a chance to check it out. This is just a quick review. Uh, I had ended up playing it on the PlayStation 4 because that's actually the version that's coming out first. You actually have to wait a bit for the uh, you know, for the uh, other Xbox version to come out. I believe it's also available on PC. Now, uh, I had to start a game from scratch to get there because obviously there was no cross save or anything with it. So that took a fair bit. That's why this review is coming out a little bit later. But I, uh, I found it a little easier to get to the end this time because I knew what was going on. As well as, I just found that the balance issues that were on the Xbox didn't seem to appear on the PlayStation. So, console-wise, that might be the better way to go. But then again, that could have been patched out later on now on the Xbox. So, take that with a grain of salt. You get about five hours or so, maybe a little longer, depending on how long you you move around and want to read every little detail of story uh, in the expansion. And you're literally going to the Foundation to to try to save uh, the old house, which is cool. Uh, it expands on the story and the mythos a bit. Uh, it it expands, but then it actually sort of answers questions and, and explains things that I never even thought of. That you know, it's introducing new concepts and and fleshing out backstory to things that I didn't even think of, which is pretty cool. Uh, there's still more you know altered objects to encounter, and and they're interesting, which I won't want to spoil. Uh, as far as new powers, you have the ability to uh, you can get the ability you know, in whatever order you want to destroy uh, sort of crystallized uh, uh, stalactites and and structures in the cavernous underground. Uh, You also have the ability to then to uh, build platforms out of that, use them to uh, destroy the hiss. Uh, Pretty cool ways to interact and use more physics-based powers, which is always welcome. Uh, The voice acting is just as top-notch. It might even be a little better. Uh, Audio and atmosphere is fantastic. Uh, Graphics-wise, great. This is something that I would love to see a complete edition of when it's all said and done on the next gen of consoles where you can have ray tracing and everything done on console because I feel like those of us that don't have super-duper high-end PCs might be feeling a little left out because this this is a game that really, really is enhanced with uh, you know higher-end graphics. Uh, that being said, is it worth purchasing separately? Um, I would say for five hours... If you really enjoyed the base game, it's going to be something you're going to want to pick up. If it's something that, you know, this is your first time buying it, there is a sale, I believe, on the PlayStation Store to get uh, the deluxe digital deluxe version, which includes the expansion. So that, if it's bundled together, it's definitely worth it. And a lot of the bugs and, and, and hiccups and things you would have had at a launch of this title haven't worked out now that it's been out over six months. So it's definitely, if you're looking for something to sink your you know teeth into and really get absorbed into this you know strange mythos and and weird altered reality game this is something to pick up i have an interesting title to talk about here that i was sent and the timing maybe isn't the 
best for this release, but they couldn't have foreseen anything. And that is uh, NIS America sent over uh, Disaster Report 4, Summer Memories. Uh, I got to play this on the PlayStation 4. It is sort of a, a disaster simulator slash uh, adventure game, <laughs> which I was sent the code. Basically, uh, I was sent it right as all this COVID-19 stuff started happening. So it's not the best timing for an actually pretty good game. Uh, I'll read you some key features from it before I get into you know a little bit more discussion on it. Uh, I, this is a series I hadn't heard of before, but basically here, uh, the game starts and uh, there is like a massive earthquake and you're sort of at the center of it. You're on the bus when it happens. Uh, the key, some of the key features are uh, there's branching paths, uh, dramatically different endings, how you interact with people, sur- uh, different endings based on survival, who doesn't survive, um, if you did the right or wrong thing, moral uh, choices that you have to make. Uh <sighs> Everywhere you go, if you, if you, let's say it's like a choose your own adventure novel. It's probably the best way to describe it. Let's say you're on the bus. You have a choice at the very beginning of the game. Uh, do I sit down or no? And uh, Or, you know, do I say something to so-and-so? And these aren't just like yes or no options. It'll say, it'll give you a bit of background. It's like, I'm going on the bus today because, and it'll list like eight different options. And one is like, I've got a job interview at the park. Uh, I'm going uh, to, to eat lunch. I'm going to um, visit a friend. And it will then branch out from there in wildly different directions. Uh, and you, there's an option where it's like, I want to sit down. I'll sit down here. No. I'll hold on to the railing. Or no. Uh, do I let uh, an elderly woman take my seat? Or no. And regardless of what you pick at the beginning, it starts to branch out and the disaster will happen and the earthquake happens. And you then... Um, based on your choices, are either injured, not injured, other people are injured, uh, you need to go get help, and you sort of work your way through this uh, story. And you don't know if you're going to en- end up with a good ending necessarily until you're really far into it and you have no idea. It's pretty cool. Uh, and there, it's talk about replayability. This is a game that has a lot of replayability. Uh, as far as you know, anything else, it, the graphics in it are pretty good you know for you know this isn't a triple a title but it's serviceable and decent the surroundings and and all the environments are really well done uh some of the the characters look a little cartoony but not anime it's sort of a weird hybrid style uh overall pretty good almost feels like like a sega title from like the late 90s if that gives you an idea of sort of how the characters move in the environment but i was really impressed with just the variety of options to choose and, and how to, the branching paths go so that's pretty solid uh, audio wise it's uh it's stereo there's nothing super fancy about it uh the english is very well translated and localized uh i didn't find any you know hiccups with the game there were no crashes or any issues uh it's not an overly large game to download so you don't have to worry about tons of bandwidth being used on it uh and it's pretty solid it's just i feel like it came out at the wrong time I think a lot of people don't want to play games about disaster. That being said, if you're somebody where that doesn't bother you or you're fascinated with, you know, telling your, you know, picking your own adventure stories, this is a pretty solid game that I think might become sort of a sleeper over the summer uh, as people start to explore, you know, what else can, uh, you know, what else can I get? Uh, Because a lot of other games are being pushed back. So it is worth checking out. I will put a link in the description so you can check it out on NES America's website and uh you know see what you think but it, i was pretty impressed that it have how branching the story can get basically he was a geeks leave me alone geek boy holy shit you geeks are badass While I've been sitting here in sort of semi-self-isolation at my apartment, uh, I've decided to go and watch as many things for review as I possibly could that have been sent over the last couple of weeks. And I did sort of a binge watch of uh, the latest four titles that Mill Creek sent over, and two of them are uh, in the Andy Sedaris collection, uh, the collection that includes... uh, uh, 
as you know, such classics as Hard Ticket to Hawaii, uh, the, that 12 movie series. They're slowly working their way through basically two releases per month. We're now into the early 90s period where the quality uh, of the films went from looking like 80s movies to looking more like 90s direct-to-video movies, but still didn't have that shot-on-video look. They still had the shot-on-film look. Um, they are in uh, you know widescreen aspect ratio. Uh, I believe it's open matte. Originally, it would have been 185 to 1 or cropped for full screen. But they are remastered um, from the 4K restoration that they did for the entire properties. Uh, audio is pretty solid, uh, decent stereo track. I was able to make out all the voices clearly, no issue. Uh, it includes all of the special features that were on the previous DVD releases, as well as um, rescanned 4K uh, Master Edition copies of the trailers. So they're pretty solid. Uh, it's Fit to Kill and uh, Hard Hunted. Uh, Fit to Kill is the one I liked better, but they're all <laughs> they're all pretty good. This is. Uh, where they started to introduce some of the newer players into it, uh, like Julie Strain. Um, and uh, it, it, from here on, you know, you get a, there's a few more titles before we get to the last couple, which look very direct to video y. This is sort of that in between period that not a lot of people talk about with these films, but they're still entertaining and ridiculous. So they're, you know, pretty much like 10 bucks, 10, 15 dollars on Blu ray. There's an MSRP is higher, but generally. Amazon, everybody's going to have cheaper. And, you know, who doesn't want something ridiculous and stupid to watch while you're stuck at home? The other two releases that I was sent over uh, are Ultraman Orb and Ultraman Eid, but these are just the movies. So previously they have released uh, earlier, like Steelbook Edition as well as Collector's Edition of each of these series with an extra disc that included the movies. Well, here we have uh, a separate release if you just want to collect the movies. Or if you want to expand what your collection has, it's a single disc each, but it includes a digital copy so that you can uh, redeem that on Movie Spree to watch uh, that way. So if you're into a lot of the, the Toku style shows, the ridiculous Ultraman, uh, you know, Power Rangers-y type stuff, uh, they're pretty solid. Uh, not much more I can say other than there are exact releases of what was in the uh, the previous release of the, t of the full TV shows. But if you want, you know, as a starting point, this might be something to pick up one of either of them because they're solid quality uh good translations as far as subtitles go uh just solid releases uh better quality and cheaper than you're going to get it in japan yeah <laughs> everything over there is way more expensive so where these guys you know you're looking at anywhere 10 20 bucks for a movie you'd be looking at a lot more for a blu-ray over there so they're probably worth checking out i will put them in uh the show description below uh it looks like there's some other releases coming this month but because of all the the interruptions and sort of supply chain stuff. It looks like some of the review items, some of the, of the larger TV shows and that are going to come later. So I'll be sure to talk about them as soon as we get them. These were sort of what they were able to get out earlier before, not that the mail shut down, but before everything slowed down to a crawl. But uh, I'm happy to hear that uh, Mill Creek sent out an email saying that uh, they are still going to have everything, you know, releasing on time. It's just some of us that, that get review copies are going to be getting them a little later. So I'll be talking about some of the bigger releases as soon as I get them. Husky, this is Deep Blue. Copy, Deep Blue. It's been a while. I'm finally getting intel on the Aurora situation. It's a real shit show. <laughs> I've been told. Drones everywhere, apparently. Like anyone would want to fight the damn things. Ever heard of something called a Terminator? Never. And I keep seeing mention of tiered weaponry. Yeah. Seems like they already took care of that, though. Anyway, I might need your help for a way in. That can be arranged, pal. Hey guys, Mike the Birdman Dodd here, and I'm here with yet another gaming review that you can use while you're in quarantine. That's right, I am talking about Ghost Recon Breakpoint on the Xbox One. I'm taking a look at their second piece of DLC known as Deep State. A review code was provided to us for the purposes of this review. So this is something I've been looking forward to for quite some time. When the first DLC event live uh, event was set for the Terminator, 
later. I actually had a lot of fun with that, and I reminded myself how much fun Ghost Recon Breakpoint could be as a shooter if you took it as that. Um, Ghost Recon Breakpoint now steps it up a level by adding in a different mode known as Ghost Mode, which makes it more immersive. Basically, injuries are changed, ammo is changed, um, if you don't want enemy markers to pop up. It's just a different way to play, and honestly should have been there from the game's launch. Now, that being said, I did not play in this mode. I played uh, regular mode with, like, tiered gear, stuff like that. In the other mode, you can pick up weapons off of dead enemies, stuff like that. Um, it's just more Ghost Recon-y than what we got uh, when the game first launched all the way back in October. So, that being said, there are also two new classes. There's the Echelon class, which is traditional Splinter Cell, um, where you get, like, a shock gun. You're rewarded for stealth kills. You're rewarded for doing a lot of things with, like, a pistol. And then there's the Engineer class, which specializes in drones, and, well, you kind of get, get the idea there. Um, so, my experience across the eight or so missions is you're trying to unravel a plot to capture a guy known as the strategist who has created this uh, controlling drones via your mind sort of thing and he's basically any stupid Marvel villain ever. Um, he's honestly not a very compelling bad guy but the big reason to come back here is Michael Ironside comes back as Sam Fisher and there's a surprising amount of dialogue between him and Nomad which makes the experience fairly worth it. Now that being said, um, I completely this fairly quickly, but my gear levels are really, really high, like the mid 200s. So I was able to tank through almost anything this DLC could throw at me until I got swarmed. I actually did die a few times on normal difficulty, which actually did kind of surprise me here. Um, in terms of mission variety, there is a turret section, there is a mandatory splinter cell like sneaking section where if you're detected, it's game over. That was annoying for about 20 minutes, and then I figured it out. Um, the game's final boss fight is a little underwhelming. I was hoping for something as climatic as fighting Walker was in the main game, but it boils down to a drone fight, and that's all I'll really kind of say about that. Though, pro tip, use the Terminator rifle. You'll find that fight will go by so much quicker, especially if you can find the right place to shoot it from. Um, however, though... Is it a worthwhile piece of DLC? Well, I beat it in about five or six hours. I probably could have sped that up a little bit quicker, but I have un unlocked a lot of those camps, so I was able to warp around the map pretty quick. Um, in terms of what you get with this, you also get a bunch of new guns and new blueprints. Um, the fourth echelon rifle um, is really good, and the fourth echelon pistol is also really good. It actually replaced my default sidearm. I was using Walker's uh, revolver. Now I'm like, screw that. I'm going to Sam Fisher time this thing and uh, having myself a stealthy blast of a time there. Um, you also unlock new skins. You unlock uh, Grimm's daughter, I think it is. You get Sam himself. You get a fourth echelon suit you can use. Um, you get the goggles. Um, so that's pretty cool. You also get a new helicopter. It doesn't have guns, but it seems quicker than the other helicopter you unlock normally at your camps. Um, I had fun with this, and right now, as of this recording, you can get the game with the Seasons Pass for about 40 bucks. That's pretty worth it, considering they are continually adding new stuff to the game. They are tweaking it, and I'm glad that Ubisoft is listening to their uh, community now, because if this is the level of detail we're getting out of a DLC for this game, I would suspect that the next episode whenever that comes out, will also be pretty cool. Um, I had a lot of fun with this. Um, I may actually go back and replay the entire game in ghost mode at some point, because I think it would be a completely new experience, and I couldn't just Rambo my way through this game. I would actually have to approach it like, you know, a military strategist, and maybe that's the way Ghost Recon should be played. However, though, that choice is entirely up to you. Once again, this has been Ghost Recon Deep State. A review code was provided to us from Ubisoft. Nomad. Glad you haven't gone soft since Bolivia. Let's go. We need to talk. Do you have any hobbies? 
I collect spores, molds, and fungus. All that thought, it's crapper time. I'm here with a review quickie of Grand Blue Fantasy Versus. It's a 2.5D uh, fighting game developed by Arc System Works on the PS4, published uh, in North America by XC Games. They sent over a copy for me to check out. Uh, it's not overly large uh, as far as the downloads go, but they pack a whole lot into that small download. Uh, the, the sort of CG in between scenes are like 3D anime CG, and then the actual battles, uh, like the, the characters are like hand-drawn 2D, like gigantic, you know, art sprite sort of thing. And then the backgrounds are 3D. Uh, and overall, it's pretty cool. It's based on a series that I was not familiar with, which is like a, a mobile RPG series that uh, they've made this this fighting game out of. And uh, it's one of the better fighting games. We've reviewed a few in the last few years on the show. And it's one of the better ones to have come out. Uh, pretty much everything Arc System Works puts out is solid. But this one, I think it's going to you know, fly under the radar because of uh, it coming out sim around the time of all the global pandemic stuff. But if you're looking for a pretty cool fighter, this is one to get. Uh, each of the characters is based on uh, the lore and, and characters in the, the previous game franchise. Uh, and the, you know, there's lots of voiced uh, parts, uh, voiced cutscenes. There's a story mode. There's an RPG mode. The RPG mode is um, you sort of fight a bunch of enemies, gain experience, level up, get different weapons... Uh, the weapons change the uh, sprites on, on the screen and, and the uh, the art assets for that. And then you level up and fight bosses. There's a versus mode, practice, all your sort of standards, other ones there. So there's a lot of stuff packed into this game. Uh, it's got really good audio. Um, it's because the music is done by uh, Umatsu, the, uh, the composer that did uh, all the, the classic Final Fantasy games. And I believe the art director is somebody who worked on... I'm drawing a blank, but I'm pretty sure it's the same art director that did Final Fantasy V and VI, maybe? Something like that. They, they've, it's, they've worked together back in, in you know the olden days of Square, uh, before Square Enix became a thing. So, uh, which is pretty neat. So, it, it's neat seeing that art style mixed with uh, that music, because that music is, is instantly noticeable if you know who's composed it. Uh, the controls are pretty smooth and tight. Uh, I didn't find it to be clunky or slow loading or anything. Uh, pretty good uh, load times on this. Just a fun overall uh, fighting game. I don't know if it's going to be something that would be like a competition game where it has to be like, it, this isn't going to be like a Guilty Gear or something, right? This is a, uh, just a little more of a fantasy anime RPG fighting game hybrid, and it's pretty cool. So I'll put a link in the description for you guys to check out. Uh, I think it's worth picking up. Uh, there hasn't really been another interesting new fighter in quite some time that, uh, that sort of just slipped out <laughs> and came out but uh, XC did a pretty good job with this Hey guys, Mike the Birdman Don here, and I am here with yet another review as we spend our time in quarantine, and that means, well, for a lot of us, we have a lot of free time on our hands, so maybe it's time to crack open some of those Lego sets we've gotten, and we're actually not talking about Lego directly, we're talking about something Lego adjacent, and that is a book coming to us from DK Publishing, that is the Lego Star Wars Character Encyclopedia, the new edition, with an exclusive Darth Maul minifigure. So, first things first, I want to talk about the Darth Maul minifigure. This is not based upon his appearance in The Phantom Menace, nor is it based upon his um, appearance in uh, Star Wars Rebels. No, this actually comes from the end of Solo, a Star Wars story, where he appears as that, like, hologram. So he does have different paint details than previous kind of minifigures, and that's something to keep in mind as I talk about this book. So this book is 224 pages of the character minifigures that have been released over the course of the nine Star Wars films, but also some of the specialty sets and promotional uh, figures that have been given away during that time period as well. So it starts off in the prequel uh, trilogy along with the Clone Wars and Rebels stuff, then moves forward through the OT and then finally into the uh, sequel trilogy. It also gives you a, a little bit of trivia about certain things like for example they talk about C-3PO and how his figure has evolved since the mid-2000s but they also talk about how at one point 
They uh, made certain C-3PO's. They made like five in the entire world made out of a solid 14 karat gold. And they were like super, super rare. I don't even know if any have shown up on eBay. Um, but they do exist. They are out there somewhere. Um, they also talk about certain minifigures that were only given away as part of promotions in blind bags or they were only sold at Toys R Us during the specific time of month. Uh, like a march, uh, for example. But they also show you how some of the molds have changed. For example, uh, Stormtroopers, I just assumed all original uh, trilogy Stormtroopers would look the same throughout um, Assess Life Cycle, Lego being how much can you really change. But no, it turns out they give more armor details as time goes on. The helmets have changed over time, and the helmets now look better than they ever have. Same with uh, the body details that have been painted on. Maybe they'll have more uh, weapon packs, or they'll have more detail to the armor, or little things like that. And it's kind of neat to see this as well. I think the main reason to have a character encyclopedia, other than just some of the wonderful photography if you happen to pick up a bunch of loose minifigs is if you want to keep track of what you own or what you want to collect in the future. So if you're buying stuff off of eBay, for example, in a blind lot, uh, you can say, okay, this comes from this set, this comes from uh, this set, and it's relatively easy to figure out. They also do give some in-universe um, explanations for certain things. Like, I didn't know there were Imperial, uh, or what is it, Advanced Recon Force, so ARF troopers. So basically people who would go in with like um, advanced recon commandos and they'd fight with them. I didn't know there was that. I know they talk about the bomb squad troopers, the airborne assault on Utapa um, and other clones. They also have like a lot of just like random background characters, but like people you come to expect from Ghost or like Chopper, Zeb, Ezra, uh, KNS, stuff like that. So it is cool. I've, I'm rather happy that I went through these 224 pages just to experience the Lego Star Wars world because I've only ever built a few sets myself. And it is neat to see this does cover things like Rogue One, it does cover Solo, and it does give you, like I said, a little bit of a sidebar in universe as to what these figures would do in their respective universes. So you can find this book uh, retailing for about $25 Canadian right now. And if you're a serious Star Wars collector or just want to break into Lego Star Wars, I don't think having this book as a resource is a terribly bad idea. I just want to talk very briefly uh, about a copy of The Division 2 that I received for Google Stadia. Yes, that's right. It just came out on Google Stadia. Uh, I actually canceled my subscription to Google Stadia, you know, when, uh, you know, I found there weren't a lot of games coming out on it. But what they don't tell you is, while the free service isn't available yet, in quotes, if you've purchased the Founders Edition or, you know, the Launch Edition, and, uh, you know, cancel your subscription, you still get to play all the games that you own. It's just not the ones that were... It's, it's similar to, like, PlayStation Plus. The ones that were given to you for free, you don't get. But anything that you own, you can still play just at 1080p max, which, to be honest at this point, is pretty much the same experience you're going to get out of the 4K one. You just won't get HDR if you have HDR support, which I'm perfectly fine with because I was able to, uh, you know, check out the, uh, the Division 2 and compare it to when we played on Xbox. And I had an Xbox One X to play on when we reviewed our... We had our long review when the game first launched. Uh, Birdman and I had a discussion. I think it was about a half hour long. And I'll say this. Uh, the game loads way faster. Way faster on Stadia. Uh, as well as... Um, just like texture popping is less um you don't get the same fidelity like the, the fine details that i found on the xbox one x but that's to be expected through a streaming service right now uh that being said i played it on you know in my pc browser i didn't even like i was like okay let's try this without hooking up uh the uh like the actual like through my phone i didn't want to do it that way and i also didn't want to have to do it through a chromecast uh, ultra i was like let's just try it in my web browser and I was like, okay. So uh, I open it up in, in Chrome, log in, 
it automatically worked with my keyboard and mouse. I didn't have to do any key mapping or anything. And I have a, a 1080p ultra wide monitor and it automatically went into ultra wide mode and knew exactly what to do. Uh, then, uh, once it detected that, uh, I was not a paid subscriber anymore, it, uh, it made it go 1080p, but I have bars at the sides because it wouldn't go into ultra wide because it's technically higher than 1080p. 1080p ultra wide is still slightly higher resolution, but regardless, it automatically knew what kind of monitor and everything I was using. It was actually pretty impressive and it was kind of neat where it wasn't using too much of my bandwidth where it's like my computer in the background could be doing a whole bunch of stuff like video editing and and uh, it was video editing and, and I had some rendering going on in the background and <laughs> that the entire uh, like Stadia session was using like 3 or 4% of my CPU usage and I was sitting there playing games and everything. It's kind of neat. Something I hadn't thought about doing before or playing with but it was kind of cool and it, you know it wasn't even like oversaturating my network bandwidth or anything. So it's kind of interesting. Super fast load times, like I've, I've sort of come to expect now with Stadia. Um, very responsive, zero like latency at all because I'm plugged in through you know keyboard and mouse as direct as you're probably going to get. Uh, overall, pretty good experience, and you know they have like an ultimate edition that includes everything, and it might end up being the preferred way that I play the Division Two now. Uh, simply because I can just take my session anywhere I want to go. Kind of neat. So something to consider if you are a Stadia subscriber uh, and you've canceled your subscription, you can still purchase games and play them at 1080p. You don't have to be a subscriber. That's one thing that they haven't told you, and they've not been so great on their marketing on that. So, you know, until, uh, you know, the service gets, you know, faster and better, it is neat to see that Ubisoft is still supporting them. And this is actually my preferred way to play. Those magnificent bastards! Color me kooky, but something very odd is going on around here. You're not allowed to talk anymore. Just some closing thoughts on the show here. I know we've had a bunch come out all at once, but uh, it was important that we get these reviews out uh, in a timely manner, and uh, it's only so much we can fit on the main show. So, I want to finish by saying I also received uh, a physical copy of uh, The Ascent on Blu-ray from VVS Films to review, and they sent over a digital iTunes code that we can give out for uh, a contest. So, look for that contest sometime, probably Tuesday, Wednesday of this week, and uh, we'll run the contest for similar to what we did, uh, you know, for the gentleman for three or four days, and then we'll announce the winner and... Uh, you get a chance to get an iTunes copy of The Ascent, which, to be honest, is a pretty cool movie. Um, it's not the best horror movie out there. It's not going to be like something that you know stands the test of time as like one of the all-time greats, but it's pretty solid. Uh, it's it's uh, the cover itself is kind of freaky. It, it's very it, yeah. Okay, it's just to say it's it's a very strange. I'll put a, a picture in the description. Uh, overall, it's competently made. A lot of uh, horror that's come out recently has been sort of it's either hit or miss. This is a, a pretty solid release. It's not going to be, um, it's not going to get the same acclaim as some of the bigger movies out there. But uh, it was a pretty solid release, and I'll give you sort of just a brief description. After a series of disturbing supernatural events in his home, Joel, a single father, comes to suspect that his son may be possessed. It's one of those kind of movies, but it is well put together. The surround sounds good. Uh, it has enough suspense. It's competent. Uh, I thought it was pretty interesting, and you can get a, you know look for a chance to win a copy for yourself digitally later on this week. Well, that's our show. All right, here's the deal. Every time you watch my show, I will send you $40. Checks will not be honored. You've been listening to This Week in Geek, your source for guaranteed nonsense or your money back. Tune in next week for more info on the most important things you didn't need to know. Check out our website at thisweekingeek.net and subscribe to our podcast through iTunes or any podcatcher. If you'd like to comment on this episode, head over to this episode's post at thisweekingeek.net and leave a comment through Facebook Connect. Follow us on Twitter at thisweekingeek.net and follow our Instagram at twig underscore official underscore podcast. Social media not your thing? Send us an email at feedback at thisweekingeek.net. We'll see you next time, and remember... Lower your shields and surrender your listenership. Just when you think this show is terrible, something wonderful happens. What? It ends. <laughs> I have to go. Somewhere there is a crime happening. 
In my Easter bonnet, with all the frills upon it, I'll be the grandest lady in the Easter parade. Look at that one, huh? Half purple and half yellow with a chickadee sticker. I'm good. Uh, can I ask a question? Why do we do this? What, what do you mean, why do we do this? It's Easter! Right, so why do we color eggs? Well, so that the Easter Bunny can hide them. Yeah, but why? Stanley, Easter celebrates the day that Jesus was resurrected after being crucified for our sins. So we dip eggs in colored vinegar and a giant rabbit hides them? That's right. You don't see the missteps in logic with that? Look, I'm just saying that somewhere between Jesus dying on the cross and a giant bunny hiding eggs, there seems to be a, a gap of information. Stanley, just dye your goddamn eggs! Do I shies again? Dude, it's a lady getting pooed on. Whoa, is it Cartman's mom? Oh, very funny. Hey, it is Cartman's mom. That's in my shiza. All righty then. Ah, son of a bitch! Get out of here, Ike. You're too young for this stuff. Bullshit. What's she doing now? That's in her shiza. Okie dokie. Ah! Click it off, dude. Click it off. Dude, what the fuck is wrong with German people?